Ah, uh, look, there are some days you get up and you're bouncing around the place. You know, you're you're eating your muesli and you're eating your apple and having your marmalade on your toast, and it's like, oh, I'm alive. I'm so high, and I'm you know, I'm really enjoying. And then there's other mornings you get up and um, you want to go back to bed. You're tired. And it's funny, you know, physical tiredness goes with emotional tiredness. Um, I always feel emotionally oppressed when I'm physically tired. And sometimes it's only, it's only when I notice that I'm emotionally tired feeling oppressed that I realize maybe there's a physical root or base to this and um, yeah and and you think sometimes you think that when you go on holidays you'll automatically be in great form but sometimes you you work so hard leading up to the holiday that the very morning that you should be in great form because you have nothing to do, you feel emotionally oppressed because you're tired and you don't realise it. So the old body is a complicated thing and the mind is a complicated thing and they are both the one, you know, the body keeps the score, as they say. You know, if you have stuff going on in your in your mind, it, it comes out in your body. But at the same time, you'd wonder about the the kind of, the engineer that created the machine and it being so dysfunctional, do you know what I mean? It'd be like an argument against God's existence that you'd say, well, like if there was a God, how the feck could he, could he kind of create such a wonky machine as a human being? But all the time, I suppose, in philosophy and in religions, you get the sense that the very dysfunctional aspect of of the human is part of the process that makes us whole, that makes us complete. You know, there's some strange kind of balance, you might say, between good and evil, although that's not a kind of a balance people talk about now. It's more like functional and dysfunctional. And, like, it's it's in... We are part of evolution. We're we're not different from animals. We are animals. So you might say that, well, the whole thing is dysfunctional, right, from the very beginning. But then then you'd say to yourself, well, well, if if we were dysfunctional, how did we get here? You know, it's like if you had a dysfunctional car and you were heading from Galway to Dublin, if the car got you to Dublin, you'd say, well, how did we get to Dublin if the car isn't working? And I think it's really the same. And the whole story of evolution is a story of, you know, violence and warfare and savagery. And, you know, in, in the animal kingdom over millions of years, quite an extraordinary sense of, you know, blood, guts and teeth and beaks and uh, pulling out eyes and things. And, and yet we did get here. And sometimes it's hard to imagine that all that was to do with the survival of the fittest, because if the survival of the fittest was really the only law in operation, then you'd have to say, how come we're here because we're not the fittest? And then you begin to think that maybe in evolution it was some of the the more clever, you know, if you had a big animal like a mammoth and you had humans who were tiny and would be terrified of it or would be terrified of a tiger or a lion, well, how is it that they evolved? And the answer is that they overcome the war with the tiger or with the mammoth by being clever, by saying things like, well, we're not able to kill that beast, so... Let's dig a big hole and taunt him so that he runs towards us and falls into the hole. You can see how in some way that happened. But another another one I often wonder about is, and this is Robert Thurman talks about this, the Buddhist teacher in New York. You know, how did the Tom evolve? 
because you don't really need it if the if the strongest was going to survive. The thumb is very much a passive part of the hand. It's the gentle opening of the hand and the giving away of the apple, the giving away of the fruit, the the being tender to somebody, embracing somebody. That thumb evolved in a kind of an interesting way. And then finally you have you know, the kind of questions that people would have asked in Auschwitz and in the concentration camps when six million Jews plus were exterminated by a modern, a modern rational secular state in Europe. And I remember when I was in Auschwitz as a visitor with a a friend he lost his cool and became really angry at the point where we went in to see the ovens there's an awful lot to see in Auschwitz and it is one of the most important visits I think you could make in your life because when you see the it's the barbed wire over the gate that it's real barbed wire it's not a movie set. And the cement posts on the fencing are real. And the place where they used to bring the inmates, the prisoners, as they'd arrive off trains, to change their clothes. Well, they brought them to this place and it was only built like in the 30s. No, the 40s. So it was as recent as many buildings you'd see in Ireland. It looked it looked like a, a pebble dashed or a VEC school or something. And what struck me when I was going to that particular building was I'm not looking at history really, I'm looking at the recent past. And to bring you through that building and at one stage you can see where everybody had their head shaved and the hair there's this huge pile of hair in the corner still there and then they show you where everybody was encouraged to leave their their baggage you know their suitcases and and that's another huge area where all the suitcases are still lying there and it is it is a most eerie and scary place and you're traveling and you can see the photographs of you know, the people, photographs that had been in the suitcases and they're just like pictures of, you know, rites of passage, young teenagers, young boys, young girls, weddings. People standing outside the door with a bicycle, just ordinary things happening. And it becomes overwhelming. And that's only as you go into Auschwitz, you know, into the the room where they used to process Ah, uh, the Jews. And you go in further then, and I suppose the two big things, one is, are the, the, you know, the gas chambers? That's horrific. And another, I think, is all the huts where people slept and lived during their time in Auschwitz. All still there. Wooden huts with, with, with little bunks, two, you know, double bunks. Sometimes you'd see a rose or a few flowers on a bunk where somebody would obviously come, somebody who, who had lost somebody in Auschwitz, a parent or an uncle or an aunt, and they had laid just a flower down on a, on a bed. And we went through this, myself and my friend, and the the absolute worst moment for him, for both of us probably, was a little section where you came to look at the ovens, you know, that where they burned bodies. It, there was ash still in, not human ash, but they've left it as much as they could like this was happening yesterday, because it was happening yesterday. And you think of, you know, 
You just go speechless when you're in Auschwitz. And you know that something profound has happened to you. And if you want to go on in life, if you want to walk out the gate and try to continue your life of fun and joy, you need a very strong resolution to do so. And that's where faith comes in for me, because Auschwitz is like the crucifixion. It's like the ultimate crucifixion of humanity. It's like, it's like if you think about God incarnate in a single individual as Jesus Christ, if you could imagine the life of Jesus being the full and complete emanation of, of the divinity, and that ending in crucifixion and in death, well then, you'd be looking at the camps almost almost like as a kind of a, a reworking of crucifixion. God being crucified in a big collective manner. It's quite frightening. And then, I know that there's a great story where Obviously, it's only a fable, but it tells the truth. And that's where all the prisoners were forced to watch hangings. You know, if so, somebody deviated from a tiny rule or, you know, was didn't obey an order immediately. For a hundred different reasons, they might be hung. And the way they would be hung, just inside the gates. And, and the gallows is still there in Auschwitz, the gallows. You can, look at the, you can look at the wooden floor that they stood on. You can, you can see where the rope hung from the crossbeam. And you stand there and you remember that all the other prisoners were forced to stand there sometimes and watch and not show any emotion, not show any compassion. Or they might end up on the gallows. Imagine the young teenagers, young women and men having to stand there and watch maybe some of their loved ones being hung in front of them. That was Auschwitz. And the story that is, I suppose, a fable, but it tells the truth. So there was an atheist and a Christian and they're, they're arguing and they're in the camp and they're always arguing about where is God. And the two of them are standing there looking at somebody being hung. And the atheist says to the Christian, well, he says, where is your God now? And the Christian says, he's on the gallows. It's like the same as in, in the story of the crucifixion, you know. That in the in this crucifixion there's something there's something amazing being told about God's presence in the world that He's with us even in this time of despair and agony and darkness, complete darkness. My God, why have you forsaken me? That's the abandonment of of Calvary, but it's also the abandonment in Auschwitz and there's another there's another thing about Auschwitz too. You know, a whole lot of the rabbis did a very interesting thing. I think it was in Auschwitz, it may have been in one of the other camps. But they had they had a legal court case to hold God to account. You know. Why had God abandoned them? And they had this legal court case and they found God guilty that, that he had abandoned them. And they left it at that. It was, it was a big... And what did they do afterwards? What did they do? You know, when they, in that moment, what did they do? They went off and prayed. So, so rather than emotionally react against what was happening, 
they were able within their faith to understand it even when God didn't seem to be present. When the night was so black that there was only death, they could actually still believe in God by recognizing that God had abandoned them for the moment but would return. And it's exactly the same idea that you get in the last words of Jesus. Why have you abandoned me? And and this sense of, of, of being abandoned by God, I suppose, is, is the word we use for it is despair. And there, there's an awful lot of suffering and pain and agony for people who feel abandoned, you know, they feel abandoned not just by their family or their loved ones or society, but they feel they feel there's something like deep at the center that that has been abandoned, you know. It's like in the previous podcasts. I was talking about the transfiguration and I was talking about, I mentioned Meister Eckhart's notion, kind of a geography like a saucer, where the very insides of you, the very core of your being, is like a space at the centre of the saucer. It's, it's, it's far away from the perimeter. The perimeter is the bit of you that engages with other people, but, but, but deep inside that there is a bit that doesn't engage with anything on the outside. And yet you can feel loved in that spot. It's it's the sweet spot for love. It's the feeling that you're loved in this space. Not by others, but by, by a, a mysterious other, by a mystical other. The other is in you, loving you. And that gives you the capacity to love. That gives you the... That's what drives you out to the perimeter and, and reach out to other people, that you are loved inside. And when that goes, you get the emptiness, the whole, as they call it in the 20th century, you know, the whole where God used to be. And you kind of examine your life and your physiology and, and your makeup, your psychic makeup, and you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just contingent and I'm contingent on nothing. I'm just an accident. I'm just here existentially suffering until I die. And that too is a kind of Calvary, you know. That too is a kind of Auschwitz. So you feel this place inside you and it's empty. And a voice taunts you, teases you, says, Ha ha, where's your God now? And the answer is God is God is there in that emptiness. That emptiness is is in a strange way the the abrasive silence of God. And that even in that emptiness He has not abandoned you. Even in the deepest loneliness, He has not abandoned you. In fact, the whole idea of incarnation is that God is suffering in your suffering, that your suffering is God's suffering. So for somebody who's in despair, then this terrible moment of darkness, this Calvary, this Auschwitz is like, oh, it's like um, not I who suffer now, but God who suffers in me. I'm now witnessing God's suffering. My suffering is God's suffering. This this also happens in the Jewish tradition of, I think I pronounce it reasonably well if I say Shiva, which is the time of mourning when somebody has has died. In the Jewish tradition, they, they have Shiva, which is a time of so many days, maybe seven, maybe nine, I'm not sure. And, and they just sit and mourn. And, and the, the idea of it is, it's, it's like the place of abandonment. It is the place where we are abandoned. 
But rather than run away from it, rather than deny it, or rather than be angry about who abandoned you, it's a ritual of living through time in that space, as if it was a real space. And when it happens in the house of the bereaved, the mourners are sitting around for a couple of days, it becomes a space. It's a physical space. This is Shiva. This this is the space of of dead, of no life. This is the, the theological or the, the ontological emptiness of the universe we are living in. And yet that ritual is a way of living with God. Because it's living with the dimension of feeling abandoned by God, but that also is living with God. Sometimes we tend to think like that, let's say you live with somebody and they abandon you. They're gone. Sometimes I'd be here in Donegal and I'd have company. Uh, let's say, I don't know, a friend friend comes from England and they're, they're, they're here and they're great for them. I have a bit of crack with them and I'm not doing any podcast and I'm not doing any work and we're walking on the beach and it's a lovely time. And then they go after two or three days and then I meet a neighbour on the street or on the road and he says, where's Mary? And I say jokingly, oh, she abandoned me. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> Vanished. And it's like we have a black and white feeling about abandonment you know that abandonment is is you're here today and gone tomorrow so she abandoned me sometimes i'd say to the poor man who's just going through a rocky period in his marriage and i'd say how's herself and he'd say she abandoned me <laughs> she went so it, it is a black and white sense that like you're here you're here and if you're not here, you've abandoned me. In theological terms, in Judaism, it's deeper. The abandonment by God is actually living with God. You're living with the emptiness. You're living with the no God. You're living with the whole at the center where God used to be. But in Jewish terms, that too is God. It's beautifully done in um, the famous book, everybody talks about it, the book of Job, J-O-B, Job. The book of Job, poor old Job, everybody abandons him and then God abandons him and it's like, poor old Job. He's living through, I remember some somebody telling me once it was like, Job was the first real existentialist poem, you know. It should have been written by Beckett or somebody. You always find that people in the 20th century, like Camus, Sartre, Beckett, Jung, they, they, everybody touches the book of Job at some stage. You know, scholars, because they know it's very important. Very important kind of insight or development of human insight. The idea that you can feel close to God is one thing, but the idea that you can feel abandoned by God, that's another journey. And if you think about it, and this I was saying in the Transfiguration uh, podcasts as well but you see that there's a kind of stepping stone thing where human consciousness becomes more and more awakened and the consciousness of God's presence as a dimension of human experience that becomes awakened and one of the big turning points is the story of Abraham and in some of the Jewish texts, which are not used by Christians, but in some of the Jewish texts, utterly beautiful poetic wisdom texts, they talk about how Abraham, so he worships the sun, right? And then the sun goes down. In He's worshipping the sun because it's powerful. He, like he, he knows it's you know, the, the flowers are smiling up at the sun and moving around with the sun and 
everybody's happy and it heats the ground and and, and everything grows and it's marvellous. So he's worshipping the sun and then the sun dies at night. Can't be that powerful. And instead of the sun, the moon comes and the moon is even, in some sense, is more powerful because that's able to light up the darkness. It's able to light up the evening, the night. It's like an extraordinary kind of idea, the moon. And so he worships the moon. And then in the morning, the moon goes. And eventually, Abraham realizes it's not the moon and it's not the sun, but it's something behind both. God is behind everything. The one God is behind absolutely everything the ocean, the mountains, the lakes, the rivers, the sun, the moon, the stars. There's something beyond everything. I sense it. And it's singular and it's God. That's transcendent God. And that's a big step for for the all humans, you know. There is one God. Now you'll get, God bless Mr. Hitchens, Mr. Fry and Mr. Dawkins. They don't take to this stuff and they may be right and I could be wrong because... I'm not expounding a philosophy. I'm just sharing with you my heartfelt enthusiasm for these ideas. I think they are so beautiful and they mean so much to me. That idea that in some sense human beings awoke to this reality, the ground of being, that there is a God. And that firm idea continues and maintains itself within Judaism, within Christianity and within Islam. They're all the one, they're all cousins, they're all like, you know, religions of the book as they call them. And they all go back to Abraham. Every Those three religions all go back to Abraham and say, that was the moment where we recognized, whether we be Islamic, Christian or Jew, that's the moment where we recognized transcendent God. That this, that this earth has a realm to it which is beyond. And the beyondness is not like beyond the stars or beyond the moon or beyond the... But it's, all, it's kind of like beyond in a, in a different way. You might say it ha- everything has depth which is infinite. Everything has being and existence. It exists at the surface, but yet it has a being in it. Its being is profoundly deep and infinite. That would be an acknowledgement, I think, for me, of the transcendent God. And nothing that's happened in the beautiful and wonderful evolution of history and the science tradition in history and the recent science of the 20th century, not, nothing has taken away, not one jot. I mean, nuclear science, quantum physics, all, all the kind of new sciences, if you like, almost reinforced the idea that what we see at the surface is not really what's there, but it's, it's an emanation, like a, a, pulsing, a pulsing organic presence, and that it has depth to it, even in physical terms that we just know nothing about and that it has interactions chemically and, and and that there's entanglements of everything in the universe that we couldn't have dreamed of a thousand, two thousand, four thousand years ago. And then after Abraham there's a there's a book called The The Secret History of Christianity I mentioned it before by Mark Fernan, and in it he tracks various moments within the Jewish tradition. Uh, The building of the temple, where where this sense of the transcendent began to express itself ritually, and then the period of the prophets, uh, Elijah and so forth, Isaiah, Amos, whatever, Daniel, the, the period of the prophets where where the prophets began to even pull back from the ritual period. 
and began to kind of focus it on the just man or the just individual. So that always this sense of God's presence is always with us. And then God never abandon us, abandons us even though we feel abandoned sometimes. And the feeling of abandon, abandonment we have is an experience of God suffering because it is God within us. We're participating in God's divinity. Extraordinary idea. And that's all there in, in the wonderful, you know, texts that come through the Jewish tradition. And their culmination, if you're Christian, is with the Jesus story. That in, in some way everything was fulfilled in this moment. Everything came to its completion in Jesus. So the whole debate begins after the resurrection. The resurrection, if you like, is a genuine experience. But it really is wrong to take it literally. It, it's actually a really reductive misunderstanding, even of the words. I mean, the words were written in in various languages that I speak in English wouldn't understand. How could I figure out what the word means in the hermeneutical context of its time with the vocabulary of other words around it in its time? In, in the beginning was the word, John starts in his gospel, but in the Greek, in arche, in, in arche no logos, in the beginning was the Logos. What, like, the word word means one thing, but Logos means something much more complex. So it's very hard sometimes to get at the sort of intellectual ideas about resurrection. The only way to think about it is in terms of experience. And the experience of resurrection, I sense, is that people understood profoundly and completely that this Jesus lived and breathed as a manifestation of the ultimate transcendent God. It wasn't just that, you know, it wasn't just that God had come down and become a human or was walking around with a human mask on him. It was also that in the history of evolution, the human individual had risen to a consciousness that understood it was the divinity within him. And Christ, in that sense, is the first man. He's the first awakened, complete, enlightened Buddha. I think that's contagious. I think love is contagious. I, th I, think, I think the strange thing about human love and intimacy is the moment you touch somebody with your presence, they are transformed by your presence. It's as if your presence doesn't contain itself within the skin of your body. And so if you walk into a room and there's somebody there like, oh, Brother Roger of Taizé that I met once in Sean McDermott Street in Dublin, or some very holy woman, you walk into their presence, or Rinpoche, my teacher, you walk into their presence and you're changed. There's something about presence that's beyond the person who's carrying it. So in that sense, you had a very real, for me, for me, I have a real belief in that sense that the apostles in different places and in different traditions, once they had gone back to their own places and all the rest of it, they were experiencing they were realizing the resurrection. They were experiencing within themselves the same presence. So how could you say this, but Jesus is risen? I have just met him. You know? And if you look at the stories of resurrection, the beautiful story about Mary, you know, she's talking to the gardener and she's in where have they put him? And the gardener looks and says, Mary. And she knows it's not the gardener, it's this is the Christ. This is the one who has risen. 
I think there's a moment, I have to say, there's there's a moment in that, and it happens in your life, it happens in my life, where you gather yourself, like your fragments, your your mind is in bits, your mind is all over the place, right? And you gather yourself into one sense of conscious being in your body, meditative, calm abiding, and in that moment, you can stay in that moment, and it's a, it's a good moment of stillness and serenity, but in that moment, I talk about a threshold. There's a threshold where you can awaken to otherness within you, not outside, but that within you there is something moving that can never be named, that is beyond language. It's, be, it's the light be, that it is painted as darkness because it is so transcendent, and yet it is at the centre. It's God within us, moving us, and that's the presence within us. And that's what's contagious. And that's what you'd experience. And when, as an individual, you experience it, you have indeed been born again. You have indeed received the Spirit with the image of fire. Because the light of this transcendent God burns away all darkness, burns away all oh, corruption, if you like. And we are figures of light. We are people of light. We are luminous. Tibetan Buddhists have the same, very same idea. They talk about this light that comes into you. It's a visualization. You can do Tara, the female Buddha. And you, you visualize the female Buddha. And, and from the female Buddha, there emanates this light. And the light goes into the crown chakra down through your body. And it goes into every sinew of your body, every little bit of your body, it, this light, and you become just transparent. Now that's a physical exercise, which is a beautiful visualization because it, it gives you a kind of a whole bodily yoga of what we get in the Gospels as an idea. We are people of light. We are children of light. We are children of light. And that's Pentecost and that's the fire. After that, as I was saying in the last podcast, all notions of hell and suffering can be seen as misunderstood, if you like, because because you're simply saying that as you come closer to God, the light of heaven burns away all corruption, burns away all things that are corrupt. And St. Paul says, you know, sin comes into the world, but then he calls sin death. And he calls death corruption. So the fire is actually, you know, burning away the mortality in a metaphoric way so that the deepest self within me or you finally becomes united with the transcendent God. And they're all the ideas that were floating around in the time, maybe a hundred years after the resurrection. Because they, were, they weren't making up language. They weren't creating an ideology. They were fumbling around with very different ideas to put words on the experience they were having. And there was different experiences because they lived in different places. There were, you know, people in Galilee had gone back to fishing after the whole event. You get stories like, you know, discovery of Jesus, like, on the beach making breakfast, or walking across the water, or, yeah, the two guys, you know, and they're walking the road, and, and this other fellow's walking with them, and, and this is this is Jesus, this is the Christ, rather, the Christ, the risen Christ, and they don't recognize him, even though they're talking about the big events in Jerusalem and your man was crucified, but they don't even recognize this guy, until the breaking of bread. And again, it, there's nothing kind of 
contorted about that. It's not a quiz. It's not a puzzle. Within the context of what was happening in their lives at the time, where they were trying to remain faithful to this strange experience of awakened being, and they were doing it by remembering, he said something particular, do this in memory of me. And so they were breaking bread and sharing wine in houses privately, ritually, to keep that presence and, and life of Christ alive in them. So it's not in any way anything but clear that they are saying, the historical thing we're so sad and so cut up about, and yet when we break this bread we recognize his presence is with us. His presence being that within each individual heart there beats the pulse of the entire cosmos. Our relationship with the cosmos is transformed. We are no longer slaves or free men, male or female. We are all one. We are all one now because we are all awake in the exact same way. The transcendent God. And 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 how did they say this comes? Well, they say put on Christ, you know. It, it The Christ now we're talking about is not from the school books in Ireland in the 50s. The Christ is... A very big cosmic idea that every quantum in the universe pulses at a surface of existence empowered by the mysterious being and that every atom is actually in love every no atom is neutral those a physicist said that on his deathbed just made an observation. I think he said the electron, he was, he was dying, he's, he spent his life studying the eyes. The electron is not neutral. In the sense of its attachment and connection and being present and functioning is an act of love. Everything in the cosmos is an act of love. We're just participating in it. As humans so that that's the miraculous miraculous sense that awakens in in Jesus now how do you deal with the the fact that the journey to this is through the crucifixion and the time that it makes most sense for people is when people themselves are being crucified and crucifixion can happen in the terrible and dark, dramatic ways that it did in Auschwitz, concentration camps. But it can also happen individually. It can happen in loneliness. It can happen when people are isolated and they feel they're alone in the world and they feel they've been abandoned. It's a hard place to be and I know of nothing more beautiful than the Jewish tradition of Shiva. To be in remembrance, to be in a space and to say that that space is the space where there is no God. It is a space of emptiness. It is a space where God has abandoned us. And yet by being in this space, by praying in this space, by declaring God's commitment to us in this space, even in this abandonment, we are linking ourselves to the very ground of our existence, our being in God. Being abandoned is part of the finger of God touching us. You get it by the rivers of Babylon. We couldn't sing. How could we sing on alien soil? And it's a geographical thing. 
and then you get it in Jesus. My God, why have you abandoned me? And you get it in the rabbis that collected in Auschwitz and held at that rabbinical court and came to a conclusion that, yes, indeed, God, despite all his promises, has now abandoned us. We are now abandoned here in Auschwitz. And at the conclusion of their adjudication, they pray. I pray in this abandonment. There's, um, there's no better and more eloquent meditation on this idea of abandonment than Psalm 91. Psalm 91, you can look it up and you can read it in an Orthodox version or in a modern version or in the King James version. And it's a very, very comforting prayer. And ironically, I I kind of thought about it this week because I was listening to Sinead O'Connor, that wonderful memoir which she wrote, and it's on audible books. You can get it and listen to her speaking her own words. And it's it's disturbing and and shocking in one sense because it's only two years ago since she wrote it or three and and you listen to her voice like she's in the room with you. And Psalm ninety one meant a lot to her and she experienced abandonment in many, many ways. In many ways. And I think that all I have to say about that is even in abandonment and even in despair, even when you cry out, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is a wonderful idea that God is even there in the emptiness, suffering the emptiness with you. It is God that suffers the pain that you're feeling. It is God who is in you, you who are in God, in this sense of despair, in this moment of Calvary, of Auschwitz. So I'll finish by reading Psalm 91, and uh, as a remembrance, I suppose, for Sinead and all that have suffered that terrible isolation in history where they feel completely abandoned. And they feel no faith. They feel no no one to reach out and love them. May, may they be with God. Whoever goes to the Lord for safety, whoever remains under the protection of the Almighty, can say to him, You are my defender and protector. You are my God. In you I trust. He will keep you safe from all hidden dangers and from all deadly diseases. He will cover you with his wings. You will be safe in his care. His faithfulness will protect and defend you. You need not fear any dangers at night or sudden attacks during the day or the plagues that strike in the dark or the evils that kill in daylight. A thousand may fall dead beside you, ten thousand all around you, but you it will not harm. You will look and see how the wicked are punished. You have made the Lord your defender, the Most High your protector. And so no disaster will strike you, no violence will come near your home. God will put his angels in charge of you to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands to keep you from hurting your feet on the stones. You will trample down lions and snakes, fierce lions and poisonous snakes. God says, I will save those who love me and will protect those who acknowledge me as Lord. When they call to me, I will answer them. When they are in trouble, I will be with them. I will rescue them and honour them. I will reward them with long life. I will save them. To pray that prayer 
in moments of emptiness, moments where you don't feel the words of it. You're joining yourself with everybody in Jewish tradition who lives through that period of mourning where they say we are in the place of the dead, we are in the place of no hope. And so we pray, so we sit, and our physical bodies just being here is a prayer. And you're uniting yourself with, in Christian terms, Jesus in the very last agony of his human life crying out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you're, not, you're uniting yourself with all those loved ones sometimes that we have loved and yet have, have gone away and been alone and chosen to end life. You're with them and you're praying for them that even in despair, even when there's no hope, God is present to love and cherish all of us and all creation. And that now is a big girl podcast. So, <laughs> you know, this is this is the first half of it. I know. Fuck's sake. What am I doing to you? Imposing all this stuff on you. Well, look. You can take it with a sort of a light heart. And um, it is the first half. Like, I'm going somewhere with this meditation. And really, where you, you know where I'm going. It's the assumption of Mary into heaven. It's thinking of what kind of religious faith or narrative cuts through the darkness, cuts through the suffering, cuts through the loneliness and the pain and the evil of Auschwitz and all other darknesses that pepper our history. How can we hold on to something and cling to something beautiful? And that's where Mary comes in, the Queen of Heaven. And I'll talk more about it. I've really only tried to reflect on the, what you might call the preliminaries, you know, the necessary reality of where we are. That's a kind of a, a thing they do in Buddhism as well. There's always a two-stage process. Okay? So, before you meditate on, like, some kind of aspect of the female Buddha, Tara, you always have a process where you, what they say, meditate on the preliminaries. And the preliminaries, in Buddhist terms, are just like very basic things the shortness of life, the certainty of death, the fact that your actions follow you like a shadow and that the only ta thing you take into some other life is your the consequences of your actions. So there's a Buddhist thing kind of reflecting on reality. They'll, they'll think about the fact that, like, you know, everybody that's alive now in this century, every single person, seven billion well, in 100 years, they'll all be dead. It'll be a whole totally different people. That in itself is like an amazing kind of thought. The continuum is, is, not, is not just us. We, we're gone, everybody. And then there's a new crowd. The shortness of life, the unexpected nature of death and how it happens. All that stuff in Buddhist terms are the preliminaries. And then, out of that you can begin to focus on, you know, the need to hold in your mind a template of beauty and goodness and eternity. It was the same way in, in the Christian tradition, and that's why this first half of the podcast for the Assumption of Mary bases itself not on the flowery language of the Assumption, but on the sense of death, and the sense of abandonment and the sense of despair and despondency that that is part of our flesh like saint paul said you know sin is death death is in us it's in our flesh it's part of us so there the pre preliminaries are done and now onwards to part two 
the flowery language. Hail Queen of Heaven. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.